welcome everybody uh, to chapel this Wednesday, September 16th. It's already September. Where did the summer go? Even with the quarantines and the not being able to really go anywhere, the summer has flown by. But welcome to chapel. Um, again, on video, the advantage to video recording my messages is uh, I get to record for you in a different location every week. Um, I'm now in the marketing room. So, you know, like I've said in the past, um, the church is not the building or the space. Uh, the church is the people. So whether we're in the marketing room or the town hall or the chapel space, we are worshiping God. Because um, it's the people coming together to worship that matters. Anyway, so we are here for chapel. It's good to be with you all. Hopefully soon we can get back to in-person worship. Uh, but for now we're being safe and protecting one another and loving our neighbors by worshiping on channel 3. Let's do the call to worship. Come, let us praise God together. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Let's tell stories of God's power and majesty, his mighty acts throughout history. For God is great and worthy of praise. Let's remember the compassion he has shown towards us, his mercy and unfailing love, generation after generation. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Let's pass these stories along to our children and grandchildren so that they too may come to know the love of our God. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Let us worship God together. So friends, at this time, let us come together for some quiet reflection. <laughs>
Friends, let us pray. Eternal God, you never fail to give us each day all that we ever need and ever even more. Give us such joy in living and such peace in serving Christ that we may gratefully make use of all your blessings and joy joyfully seek our risen Lord in every one we meet. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our Psalter this afternoon comes from Psalm 145. Psalm 145, we'll do verse 1 through 8. I will exalt you, O my King and my God, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed. I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. My friends, again, let us take a few moments of quiet reflection. Friends, now this is the time we come together uh, in prayer uh, for each other. Uh, we share joys uh, and concerns, what we're happy about, what we're sad about, uh, and everything in between. Uh, so obviously, since we're not in person, I can't ask you what your prayers are, uh, but you can take this time now and a moment to, uh, to lift up uh, yourself in your room as you're watching this. Uh, lift up. Uh, what you think needs prayer, what you're happy about, what you're sad about, um, whether you say it verbally and audibly or you say it to yourself, uh, it matters to say 
to let those prayers out to God. Uh, we continue to pray, pray for this nation uh, and the, the virus, the pandemic, as it continues to spread. Uh, we lift up all those in healthcare and frontline workers, especially those here in Bristol Glen uh, who need encouragement and support and need to know that they are doing a good and faithful service. Uh, we continue to pray for nurses and doctors and aides uh, and for pastors and for chaplains and all support staff who are uh, trying to get through this the best they can. So pray for your pastors too. Uh, this has not been a vacation for your pastors. They are trying to navigate and lead you through this pandemic. Even though you don't see them day to day, they are working and struggling and busting their butts to lead you spiritually and faithfully. Uh, we pray for those who are suffering in mind, body, and spirit that they may find hope and peace. So let us pray now. Lift up your joys and concerns. Oh God, we know you hear our prayers, whether we voice them or not. Uh, please accept the meditations of our heart. Uh, and may they be pleasing unto you. We ask all these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as we pray together with the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture comes from the book of, the, of Paul's letter to the Philippians. This is a great book, one of Paul's letters to a church. So Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. Listen now for the word of God. For me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I'm convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress <coughs> excuse me, and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a matter worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or I'm absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in the spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation, and this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I am still alive. Here ends the word of God. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and forever will be. Amen. <coughs> This is a great passage from Paul. Um, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I mean, everything is for Christ. <clears throat> but probably my favorite verse out of this entire passage is live a life worthy of the gospel. 
but this is a good this is a good passage on life and death you know Paul is writing this when he's imprisoned in Rome you can imagine he would rather be dead and have it all over with the suffering the trials that he's going through <clears throat> but Paul is reflecting on death and life um you know, when we when we do a funeral, we talk about the resurrection. You know, the celebration of life and the the <clears throat> witness to the resurrection is we we take joy in the fact that when our loved ones, who are believers, pass and they die, that they go to be with Jesus Christ. They see Him in the resurrection. We long for that. We want to be there with them to see the resurrection. <clears throat> We don't want to go through these struggles. It, it's hard. This life is hard. Life is hard. Look at what we're going through right now. Some of the stuff I'm sure your generation, the older generations went through. World War II, uh, Vietnam, Korea, the Persian Gulf, um, even further back, the Civil War, you know. What our forefathers and our forebears went through what christ went through on the cross you know every movement that has sought to make a life better it's been a struggle this pandemic has not been easy for anybody for anybody uh it's hard to go through struggles it, it, and i i've seen it here at Bristol Glen, I've seen it when I worked at the hospital. Times of struggle make us question and doubt and uh, ask God, why? Why are you doing this? Why are you letting this happen? Um, I think in, in those times of struggle, we don't see it in the moment, but uh, it's not so much that God does it to us, but that God is with us in the moment and that Great learning can come of that moment. Great things can come out of times of struggle. Uh, God is sovereign. God is in control. God is always in control. But that's not to say that he, he, he makes us suffer on purpose. Um, right? Since the fall of man, since Adam and Eve, uh, since that first time we sinned, struggle and death and evil came into the world um, but that doesn't mean that God isn't present in that but Paul realizes while he's in Rome that yes he much rather would be dead because it's much better to be dead and up in heaven with Christ in the kingdom with Christ but no he would much be, he's hard-pressed. He'd much rather be in the flesh, living, because he knows that his suffering for Christ is informing, has informed not only his life, but is informing the entire church at Philippi. Uh, it's informing the church at Rome. It's informing the church at Corinth. Um, he is eager to remain in faith, to see them, to see these churches progress in their faith. So that they, because he, he, he says if he can sit and boast in Christ in his suffering, he knows that they too can boast in Christ through their suffering. And that's when he gets to the part of live a life worthy of the gospel. So that whether I come to see you or I'm absent, I can hear that you are living a life worthy of the gospel. The good news that Jesus lived, died, and rose again for us. So when you live a life worthy of the gospel, even in the midst of struggle and pain and pandemics, what does living the gospel look like? It looks like lifting up your neighbors, lifting up and sharing the good news that Jesus is Lord, 
It doesn't look like complaining about your pastor because you haven't seen him in six months. It's not complaining about your neighbor because they worship differently or if they enjoy a different style of worship or if they think are more conservative or more liberal on a political issue than you are. Living a life worthy of the gospel is reminding them, regardless of who they are and regardless of who you are, that Jesus Christ is risen and he loves us and he accepts us. That is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ defeated death for us. It's going to suck. I don't want to die. I do not want to go through the physical process of dying. But I'm looking forward to death, to be with Christ. But I know that in the meantime, right now, I have to do my best to share the love that Christ has given me and shown me, the forgiveness he's given me, the grace he's given me. I have to show that to all of you guys. And hopefully then you can all show that to someone else. That's a life worthy of the gospel. That is a life worthy of the gospel. So friends, to live as Christ, to die is gain. Yes, we will, get, we will gain when we die because we will be in Christ's kingdom uh, to worship and glorify him forever. But in the meantime, let's live a life worthy of the gospel. Let us love our neighbors. Let's love God. We can't love our neighbor, neighbors if we don't love God. But then remember to love your neighbors because that's a life worthy of the gospel. All right, friends, that has been our sermon. Let us now take a few moments of quiet reflection. Friends, live a life worthy of the gospel. Ultimately, Christ is the judge, but live a life worthy of the gospel. And we'll get through this. We'll get through the hard times. We will. Trust me. All right, friends. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May he make his face to smile upon you and place upon you peace, both now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth to worship and glorify God. Alleluia. Amen. In the 48 years since I was first ambushed by Jesus in a little chapel in the Allegheny Mountains of Western Pennsylvania, and in literally the thousands of hours of prayer, meditation, silence, and solitude over those years, I am now utterly convinced that on Judgment Day, the Lord Jesus is going to ask each of us one question and only one question. Did you believe that I loved you? That I desired you? That I waited for you day after day? That I long to hear the sound of your voice? The real believers there will answer, yes, Jesus. I believe in your love and I try to shape my life as a response to it. But many of us who are so faithful in our ministry, in our practice, in our church going, are gonna have to reply, <clears throat> well, frankly, no, sir. I mean, I never really believed it. I mean, I heard a wonderful, a lot of wonderful sermons and teachings about it. In fact, I gave quite a few myself. But I always thought that was just a way of speaking, a kindly lie, some Christian's pious pat on the back to cheer me on. And there's the difference between the real believers and the nominal Christians that abound in our churches across the land. No one can measure like a believer the depth and the intensity of God's love, but at the same time, no one can measure like a believer the effectiveness of our gloom, pessimism, low self-esteem, self-hatred, and despair that block God's way to us. Do you see why it is so important to lay hold of this basic truth of our faith? Because you're only going to be as big as your own concept of God. Remember the famous line of the French philosopher, Blaise Pascal? God made man in his own image, and man returned the compliment. We often make God in our own image. He winds up to be as fussy, rude, narrow-minded, legalistic, judgmental, unforgiving, unloving as we are. In the past couple of three years, I have preached the gospel to the financial community in Wall Street, New York City, the airman and woman of the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, a thousand physicians in Nairobi. I've been in churches in Bangor, Maine, Miami, Chicago, St. Louis, Seattle, San Diego, and honest, the God of so many Christians I meet is a God who is too small for me because he is not the God of the Word. He is not the God revealed by and in Jesus Christ who this moment comes right to your seat and says, I have a word for you. I know your whole life story. I know every skeleton in your closet. I know every moment of sin, shame, dishonesty, and degraded love that has darkened your past. Right now, I know your shallow faith, your feeble prayer life, your inconsistent discipleship, and my word is this. I dare you to trust that I love you just as you are and not as you should be, because you're never going to be as you should be.